Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I hope Aaron can uh, fix his issues here. Um, but in any event, we'll find some way to make this work. Um, I don't have any opening remarks. I just have a few acknowledgements that I'd like to offer. Um, for starters, I'd like to thank Aaron for agreeing to chair this joint meeting of the Committee on Adjudication and the Committee on Administration and Management. I'd also like to thank uh, the Staff Council for our project, Danny, and, and also Matt Gluth, who's somewhat new to ACUS, for their excellent work on the project and our principal deputy research director, Jeremy Grayboys, who I believe is on in the meeting. Yes, there's Jeremy, um, for um, suggesting this project and then guiding it along from the beginning. Um, we owe special thanks to our consultant, State, uh, Dan Hull of Stanford Law School, also a member of ACUS, uh, Dave Marcus of UCLA Law School and Gerald Ray, formerly of the Social Security Administration for writing such an excellent report. Dan, Dave and Gerald are certainly worthy successors to our senior fellow, Professor Jerry Mishaw of Yale, who served as the consultant for, a, for the similarly titled recommendation from the early 1970s that we're now um, revisiting and uh, I hope breathing some new life into. Jerry sends his regret, regrets that, he, that a scheduling conference, excuse me, a scheduling conflict prevents him from joining us today. I hope we'll have a chance to hear from Jerry at some point um, during the committee process and then maybe also at the plenary session. Uh, I also understand that Jerry has submitted some comments which have been circulated. I have, haven't myself read them. Uh, and finally, of course, I'd like to thank, thank all of our members in attendance today. We have uh, a very good group, both in terms of numbers and in terms of expertise. And with that, I don't know if Aaron is, uh, is Aaron with us, Danny, or no? He is with us. He's on his phone, but perhaps I can just go through the RSVPs at this time. Well, I'm, that's all I have. Thank you again, um, Aaron and Danny. The meeting is is yours. Okay, um, I'm a, a much less good uh, Aaron at the moment, so forgive me if I make any mistakes. But um, just to kind of uh, go through uh, the roll call, um, so I'm going to call two uh, two rolls. The first are the names of all the committee members and alternates of committee members. And after your name is called, I'd like to ask you to say here so we can make sure that your mics are working. Uh, and then I'll do a second roll with names of ACUS members who are not on the committee uh, and their alternates. And if your name is called, you should also say here to make sure that your mic is working. Um, and uh, we can kind of get started on that. But I'll, I'll note at the outset that Dan Ho is a uh, consultant on this project and will not be participating in his capacity as an ACUS member. Uh, but he, uh, you will hear from him shortly with uh, his overview, um, among others, among the other consultants on their report. Uh, so with that, I'm going to get started. Um, so I see that Aaron Nielsen here, he's the first on my list. I'm going to give him a, a pass for the moment. Uh, Nadine Mancini. Here. Great. Uh, Kent Barnett. Here. Great. Uh, I know Jack Bierman, are you here? I know he's coming in and out, and I think he's going to be on the phone, so we might hear from him later. Uh, Warren Belmar. Going. Uh, I know some some folks are joining us at the three p.m. hour or three thirty, so I may say their names, but they uh, probably won't respond. So Amy Bunk, are you here yet? I believe you're coming at three thirty. Uh, John Cooney. I see you, John. Here. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Annika Cooper. Here. Great. Uh, Tobias Dorsey, I believe he's joining us at 3 p.m. Uh, so we'll wait to hear from him. Uh, let's see, Claire Evans. Here. Great. Uh, Hi Feldblum, I believe she's also joining us at 3 p.m. So we'll wait to hear from her. Uh, Bill Funk. Here. Great. 
Rob Gerard. Here. Okay. Uh, Susan Grundman. Right here. Uh, Allison Ho. Here. Great. John Kaminsky. Here. Great. Renee Landers. I believe she's joining us now. Here. Oh, great. Wonderful. Um, let's see. Tristan Levitt. Here. Uh, Robert Lesnick. Here. Hey, Judge. Jeff Lovers. Here. Uh, Alexander Manuel. Here. Great. Uh, David Pank. Here. Great. Nina Olson, I believe she's joining us at 3.30. Uh, Jesse Panuccio. Roxanne Rothschild. Here. And Kate Shaw. Here. Jim Tozzi. Here. Let's see. And I'll just ask after you uh, speak to make sure you remember to mute yourselves if you're not speaking. Uh, let's see. And Dr. Russell Wheeler. Oh, I think your your audio might be a little off. I yeah, I'm not. I'm. I'm your audio is coming through a little garbled. Um, okay, is there anyone on the committee that I did not, whose name I did not uh, call out, who's in attendance? Great. Um, so uh, I'd like to acknowledge Dan Ho. Um. Great. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Danny. And oh. so we'll, we'll I will keep oh. going as as in your. Oh, okay. Just you're still taking the role. All right, I'm still present. Taking the role. Yep. Uh, and then, okay. So I think I think that's it on our end. Um, is there anyone who uh, I may have missed or joined late? I'm here now. <clears throat> okay. Great. Um, it looks like the audio is working. Wonderful. Okay, Aaron, how are you doing? I think I'm going to have to do this on my phone. Um, okay. <laughs> that sounds horrible, but that's what we're going to we're gonna have to do it. Okay. Um, so, such is life. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. So, Aaron, do you want to kind of get started um, on just opening remarks? And then we can go through uh, to the project consultants and their overview of the report. Sure, though I'm going to have to call an audible on uh, on the remarks. The way that we usually do this on Zoom is you say you want to be recognized in the chat feature, and then I will call on the person um, to speak. I'm not going to have that capability. I'm struggling here on my phone. So, Danny, can you be the person who's yep. monitoring the, the chat function for us? Will do. All right, perfect. Um, so the way it's going to work is... Um, you know, we're going to go through the process. We're going to hear from our consultants first, and then we're going to jump into the um, to the recommendations. We don't have a preamble yet. Um, we're going to see how it goes today, and we hope to have a preamble either this meeting or, or either the second meeting, or if we go to the third meeting, the third meeting. Um, and so we'll, we'll do it that way. Um, the way the rules are, let me let me see the rules. Um, um, all right. So only ACUS members. Um, uh, including government members and their designated alternates, um, uh, public members, senior fellows, ladies and representatives, special counsels, um, have full speaking privileges. Uh, meaning if you're not an ACUS member, um, you should um, ask in the chat if you'd like to speak. If we have time, um, we will give you uh, an opportunity to speak. Typically we will, um, but by, by operation of our bylaws, you don't have a right to speak. Others who are ACUS members do. Uh, to avoid background noise, um, please keep your microphone on mute and um, and and comment in the in the chat function if you want to speak. And Danny will call on you. Uh, please use a webcam unless you can't. I understand that sometimes it's not possible, but to the extent you can, please use a webcam so we can see each other. Um, and um, 
I think that is that is it. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the project consultants. Great. Uh, thanks, Aaron, uh, for th that um, framing. Uh, we were just going to offer very brief um, sort of framing remarks. Uh, you have the underlying report in front of you. Um, uh, so just to, to kind of give you a little bit of a sense of the, the context, uh, as Danny had mentioned, in 1973, there was a report and recommendation led by Professor Jerry Mashaw that recommended that agencies utilize caseload management systems and statistical quality assurance systems to improve uh, the accuracy and fairness of adjudicatory uh, systems. And uh, generally the, the sort of working uh, uh, notion of what a quality assurance system is, is a kind of formal or informal practice to improve the quality of decision-making. And for purposes of the report, we really treated those practices as things that stood independently from appeals uh, systems themselves. The motivation, of course, is, is obvious probably to everyone uh, joining this meeting today. Uh, decisional accuracy stems from uh, procedural due process under uh, Goldberg and, and Matthews and, and many other uh, uh, cases. And probably what's also well known to uh, all of you, you joining today is that there are pretty serious challenges to the decisional accuracy given the complexity of agency adjudication, uh, the volume, um, and some of the work uh, uh, that is really documented the limits of appeal systems as the exclusive mechanism to uh, control the, the quality of, of decision making. And I think Professor Mashaw's comment goes even further than that to really talk about how we should think about quality assurance uh, uh, at a different level of adjudication going down to, to, to line level uh, uh, decisions below the AJ or ALJ level. Um, uh, I'll turn it over to, to Dave and Gerald in a, in a minute. Uh, the, the only other thing I'd offer here is that uh, Dave, Gerald, and I have all worked on studying quality assurance systems uh, uh, in our own work, the, uh, particularly focusing on agencies like the Board of Veterans Appeals, the Social Security Administration, the Executive Office of Immigration Review. Uh, and part of the context for this report is that there's pretty substantial heterogeneity in the quality assurance practices across agencies, but we've also observed a lot of desire by agencies to figure out how to design the kinds of systems that Judge Ray really spearheaded for the Social Security Administration, which has had the most extensive amount of experimentation uh, in work, for instance, that Jeff and, and Judge Ray have, have documented. Um, the canonical model of quality assurance stems from the 1973 report that relies on random sampling of a small number of cases and uh, uh, providing uh, feedback to, to adjudicators uh, uh, based on a kind of re-review of that random sample. A big question that we can tackle in the report is how do we translate these kinds of insights that have uh, emerged uh, for agencies, for instance, that may have much lower volumes of adjudication than the SSA. Uh, we're grateful to many of you on the call who have offered your time to interview. We've talked to a range of different agencies uh, uh, in preparation for this report. Um, and I think two of the main contributions of the report are really to think through some of the, number one, some of the institutional design considerations of how to build out a quality assurance program like this, which uh, Professor Marcus will cover. And then uh, some of the really interesting emerging practices around the use of data um, and artificial intelligence that give content to what Professor Masha uh, noted in 1973 about statistical forms of quality assurance. So with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Marcus. Thanks, Dan. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I just want to uh, pick up where, where Dan left off. Uh, first of all, thank you all very much uh, for uh, uh, your engagement with this project. We're really eager to hear uh, your thoughts about the report and about the recommendations. Um, let me just uh, offer a few words about the approach that we've decided to take in this report. Um, uh, given federal agencies' heterogeneity, uh, a one-size-fits-all program for quality assurance doesn't make sense. We, we spoke with uh, officials at agencies where every decision goes through multiple levels of review uh, before issuance. Um, and we also have studied agencies and spoken with officials at agencies where caseloads would never permit that sort of scrutiny. So the, the quality assurance needs at, at agencies are determined by a host of variables. 
and and it really makes it, it difficult to just identify a, a particular program that would work uh, work work for all. So what we tried to do instead was to identify, as Dan mentioned, identify key design dimensions for quality assurance programs to so that that we could identify the core questions that we believe an agency ought to answer when designing a program and then to suggest considerations that design choices ought to account for as agencies uh, embark to, to answer these questions. Um, uh, each of our key design questions involves a host of considerations. Um, you have a report, so I, I won't uh, belabor what we wrote uh, uh, right now, um, but let me just comment briefly on one of these design questions, just to give you a flavor of the approach that, that we've taken. So the, the question, one of the questions uh, that an agency needs to answer is, who ought to participate in quality review? Um, there are a lot of variables that may affect the appropriate answer to this question. Uh, a large agency handling uh, a high volume of cases may consider an independent dedicated team composed of personnel for whom quality review is their sole job duty. Uh, at a smaller agency, um, it may be wise to opt for a peer review system um, where peer adjudicators exchange draft decisions and comment on each other's work. But whatever is appropriate for the agency, um, uh, given its size and, and personnel resources, common principles ought to guide the design of the program. Reviewers, of course, need to be expert in the relevant decision-making domain. They need to command the respect of their peers, uh, and they need to exercise independent judgment about the accuracy of decisions under review. So that's just sort of a, a, a flavor of the approach that we've taken to try to identify key design questions and then considerations that ought to guide their answer. Um, so just to elaborate, other core principles ought to inform agencies' answers to other design questions. Um, the question of, of, of what is the appropriate measure for quality is a very difficult one. Um, uh, the answer to this question requires an agency to settle on, for instance, the appropriate standard of review that uh, reviewers ought to administer when uh, uh, deciding whether a particular decision measures up. Um, again, given agency heterogeneity, there's no single way to resolve these sorts of challenges, but again, common principles can guide uh, agencies as they work through them. Um, so for instance, um, our report stresses the importance of disclosure. Uh, whatever standard of review an agency opts for, uh, we think it's essential that the agency uh, report that standard uh, along with uh, whatever results that it, it, it calculates uh, when it's, it's uh, reporting a, a end, you know, end of the year, end of the quarter quality measure. Um, so so that just gives you a, a flavor of the approach that we've taken uh, in this report and, and why we, we took it. Um, let me let me end there and, and turn things over to Judge Ray to, to comment on a, a couple of additional aspects of our work. Hello, and thank you for inviting us uh, to the meeting today and for allowing us to uh, work on this, uh, what we think is a very important uh, report that uh, we've, we've been able to draft. So I was the uh, former deputy executive director uh, at the Appeals Council on Social Security, and we reviewed ALJ decisions both on appeal and uh, on the own motion of the Appeals Council. And I, let me first give a disclaimer and note that I am retired and I'm not speaking for that agency or any other agency at this time. <clears throat> but I will talk about a little bit about my experience there because we think it's germane to, uh, to particularly for larger agencies in terms of how they might go about uh, crafting uh, improved quality assurance. So one of the things that I had an opportunity to work on was an electronic case management system. They had built a new system. We started moving cases to electronic folders. And within that system, uh, we built a case analysis tool. And the way we did that was we sort of uh, mapped the different laws, regulations, procedures, policies, and so on uh, to each of the about 2,000 or so policy compliant decisions that you can issue in a disability claim. We use that information then to build this case analysis tool. So as our analysts and uh, uh, attorneys uh, looked through the cases, they could capture structured data about the quality of the work. We then visualized the data that we captured, including reasons for remand. And we could, we could break that out by office, by judge. Uh, and so we had, I think initially we had about 153 different reasons why cases were remanded. And then you could see sort of who was making which errors and, and then you could delve into why. Uh, we then expanded a quality assurance review, looking at more cases uh, on sample review, on own motion review, and also started uh, a uh, sort of a stratified sample that was not random, but was based on characteristics of the claim. Uh, and we did that post adjudication so that those reviews did not uh, in any way change the outcome of the case or interfere with judicial independence. 
they didn't basically uh, do anything other than provide us with information that we could use to provide training. We then developed training on each of the uh, reasons for remand and put that in a web-based tool and, and push that out to the judges so they would have that uh, readily at, at, uh, at their access uh, anytime they got a remand or had an issue uh, that might result in a remand. Uh, from that work, we also were able to then, uh, one of our analysts in particular, uh, a guy named Kurt Glaze, uh, came forward with the idea of building uh, some natural language processing and machine learning powered uh, tool to uh, essentially read the judge's decision and, and spot about 30 or so of the, of the most common types of errors. And it could do this in about a second. It would simply run against the, uh, against the decision and, and, and find language that uh, seemed to be not policy compliant. Uh, so that, that sort of uh, artificial intelligence, I think it was one of the, the first types of artificial intelligence used in adjudication uh, in, in administrative law, as far as we know. And since then, they've built that all morning. We, we originally built it for the Appeals Council, but we realized it would actually help the judges more if we pushed it out to the ALJs so they could run it against their own decisions and fix problems before they arose so it wouldn't result in remand and delay in the case. So that's pretty much, I think, uh, what I wanted to talk about on, on this, just to give you a flavor of sort of where we went in, in Social Security Administration. But again, I'm, I'm not speaking for SSA. I'm, I'm simply retired at this point, but I did have that, uh, that experience. So thank you. All right, perfect, thank you. Um, so I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump into the recommendations and what I'm inclined to do this time before we get into like number one, two, three down the line is we have various um, subsections of recommendations, kind of groups of them. And I just want to know as we get started, are there any concerns or thoughts that people have about the main um, categories of recommendations that we have or other big picture ideas that we should think about before we get into the specifics? Um, and I'll let Danny help me um, call on people here. Uh, Rob Gerard. Uh, yeah, sure. I actually had a, a question about uh, the methodology of the report. Um, re reading the report, I saw that your case study focus was on um, appellate adjudication programs uh, employing evidentiary hearings, such as the Merit Systems Protection Board, the SSA hearing program, the Board of Veterans Appeals. Um, but, but I work for an agency that uh, almost entirely conducts uh, uh, hearings without any legal requirement, uh, or excuse me, adjudications without any legal requirement for a hearing, what the, the conference referred to in recommendation 2016-4 as, as uh, type C adjudications. Did, did your report touch on those types of adjudications as well, or was the focus really on appellate uh, uh, hearings that have uh, legal, uh, legal requirements for evidentiary hearings. Um, I, I'm happy to address that, but, but uh, the other consultant should feel free to, to jump in. So this goes back to the Michael Asimo type ABC uh, sort of typology. Um, and uh, type C is the kind of adjudication that does not uh, occur through legally required evidentiary hearings. Um, there is some variance, I think, in the, the range of agencies that we've uh, uh, talked to. Um, so for instance, uh, uh, BVA is not required to have an evidentiary hearing. The, the claimants can request it for the majority. Uh, you know, there's not actually a, a kind of hearing uh, with a claimant uh, um, uh, as would happen with, uh, through kind of the, the typical ALJ uh, uh, process. Um, and I think, uh, you know, uh, we did start off from kind of uh, uh, the types of adjudications that are closer to type A or uh, B, but we think, uh, and, and we thought about this a bunch in the report, we are still actually very much hoping to interview some agencies like the, the PTO, uh, or if your agency were interested, for instance, in talking to us, uh, because we actually think that a number of these institutional design principles, which is sort of the bulk of this report, 
are really potentially relevant for uh, um, other types of adjudications as well. The Patent and Trademark Office, uh, for instance, has a range of different quality assurance initiatives, including a, a peer review uh, a program, um, similar kinds of quality metrics that SSA uh, developed. So we do think that there is uh, some uh, degree of portability uh, across types of adjudications that don't necessarily hinge on um, a legally required evidentiary hearing. Uh, but um, uh, Dave and Gerald, feel free to chime in if you have anything else to note on that front. I, I think that that covers it, Dan. Thank you. I, I, so I, you know, I think we do have a, a, Judge Ray does have some insight into uh, state level DDS offices within the within SSA, which I think probably is closer to uh, what you're describing than the required hearing ALJ convened hearing. Um, and and I so so I think we we do have in mind uh, um, uh, that that type of adjudicatory context as well, and and think that our principles. Uh, uh, should extend there, but but it's a, it's a you know it's a it's a useful reminder and a good point, and we certainly will go back and, and make sure we feel like we're we're at least ex explaining where uh, our report is germane um, in, in ways that perhaps we haven't done so yet. That's helpful, and I think certainly uh, when we get to the preamble, um, it would probably be helpful to to have a note in there uh, that that the focus was on the type A and type B. Uh, hearing programs, uh, but that, that you believe that that there's applicability uh, for the type C adjudications as well, just so that the reader understands where your focus was. I agree. That I think that makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Robert. Um, and, uh, Jeff uh, has his hand up. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to mention something. I, I, I took a look at recommendation seventy three three, which is um, a lot shorter, but there's one paragraph in there that covers or has, has some notions that aren't reflected in this draft, and it's paragraph three, which I'll just quickly read. Agencies should employ such other techniques for gathering information on their adjudication process, including field investigations and special studies, as are required for the evaluation of accuracy, timeliness, and fairness. Agencies should be particularly sensitive to the need for better information on the extent to which claimants personal resources, social status, and access to representation or other assistance may affect the adjudication of claims. Um, so that brings in a couple of, of thoughts like, you know, there are some other information gathering techniques that could be used by agencies in, in support of quality assurance and also the highlight on claimants on, on parties or claimants personal resources. I realized that 73-3 was limited to adjudication of claims of entitlement to benefits or compensation, whereas this recommendation is, is just about adjudication more generally. But I just wondered if you had given any thought to coming up with an analog to that, to that paragraph. Yeah, I'm happy to take a crack at that. I'm glad you you noted that, uh, uh, Jeff. So we do actually have, um, uh, we cite to an, a really great example of this actually from the BVA that did a specialized study um, on uh, extra scheduler ratings in that context, which were causing a huge number of, of remands from the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims back down to the BBA. And what was really interesting about that, it was, it was a much more qualitatively driven study, but informed by the very initial striking finding of how often they were getting reversed and remanded on extra scheduler uh, uh, hearings issues, and then did a really in-depth, I think it was nearly a hundred page internal report to try to analyze uh, what was going on, how uh, the staff attorneys and adjudicators were really understanding um, uh, that, that case law. So, so we have that kind of tucked in uh, to sort of uh, section 4B of the report, but we can probably draw the connection more closely to recommendation uh, um, three, 
uh, of the original 1973 uh, report. Uh, the, the other part that I think was interesting in terms of the language that you just read out was, um, you know, uh, paying particular attention to claimants' personal resources. That is part of actually what we think is quite valuable about the kind of data infrastructure that Judge Ray built out at SSA. If you have that kind of data captured, you can start to understand um, you know, uh, uh, impact of, of uh, council and, and, and claimant resources. Indeed, the, the very impetus, I think, for a quality assurance system like this uh, is, or, or, is, or is, it's strengthened by the studies that have shown that in certain adjudicatory contexts, um, appeals are a really unrepresentative sample of the kinds of issues facing adjudicators. Uh, because it's only the subset of cases where there's legal representation that really uh, get appealed to the federal courts. And uh, uh, we uh, talk at, at you know, some length about the motivation there for, for why, uh, uh, as a result, uh, it is probably not the best practice to rely exclusively on uh, remand orders to, to think about what uh, emerging quality issues might be. Dave and Gerald, do you, do you have other? If I, if I could just mention the uh, one of the other techniques that SSA used was these focused reviews that I mentioned, where we looked at, at issues <clears throat> a post, on a post adjudicative basis. And part of the reason we did that was because we thought that some of the policies and procedures were crafted in such a way that they were resulting in, uh, in divergence of opinion in terms of what they actually meant. And so as you drill down a little further and you figure out how people are interpreting the laws in different ways, you realize that maybe you can tighten things up. So we did some, I wouldn't call it a study, but we certainly delved into the reasons why people were, were reaching different results on a post adjudicative basis and used that to help craft new language for uh, some policy and procedural changes, which we think ultimately improved uh, quality overall. And Jeff, as to your specific point as to the recommendations, I think the closest that we have to addressing what you are saying is recommendation 18, which is um, agencies should affirmatively solicit feedback from the public adjudicators and other agency personnel concerning the functioning of their quality assurance systems and provide a means for doing so. Um, I, I don't think that's as complete as what you were uh, from 1973. Um, the 1973 is still, of course, obviously in effect, um, but maybe when we get to 18, if you want, we can have some language to build that out. Would that, would that address your concern? I think so. That's a good place to add some of that, some of those thoughts that are are now in the paragraph that I just put in the chat. Great. Uh, when we get to eighteen, so let's put a pin in that. Um, whoever's running the computer, maybe Danny. Um, when we get to eighteen, that will loop back um, to Jeff's points and maybe incorporate some of that language. Yeah, I've dropped a note. Um, I, I've, I've shared my screen now and dropped a note under assessment and oversight. Um, I just want to know that, hi, I think you have your hand up. Is that right? Yep. Um, so just in response to the question about the sections, et cetera, I, I like all of those. Um, I, my thought is that when I think about agencies sort of feeling that this recommendation will be value added and they're gonna actually do something with it. I think the point about what data that sh they should be collecting, which is currently in 10 and 11, is actually very helpful. So obviously in the preamble, we'll presumably say that some agencies have already tried to start some of these. I know at the EOC, we tried to do various things with our um, federal sector cases. So basically you're saying the preamble, if you're doing this already, here's value added things to look at. If you haven't at all done it, then here are you know ways to start. But one thing that they can do right off is look at the data they have been collecting so far and what they aren't collecting. And I found that very helpful in terms of 10. Um, again, I've, when we get to it, a few sort of smaller comments, but it's helpful in terms of what to do. And then 11, again, we heard in terms of the AI, I think can be helpful. Um, so almost if there was a heading right up front, you know, set up the quality assurance standards. And then the second is data collection, <laughs> which is basically sort of, it could even just be 10, you know, in terms of here's what you should have in your systems. And then 
I mean, maybe the A1 is still where it is and I forgot what it's called. Um, I, I, I can probably, yeah, let me see what it's called in my, um, you know, and then you get to the personnel, et cetera. I'm not, by the way, saying that we should at this point mess with the document and do that. It's just as an overall point that struck me. Yeah, it's right now under timing of and process for quality assurance review. You have eight at what point, nine had to select them, and then 10 is your data collection point, which I think is different from what you have in the heading. Um, the artificial intelligence could probably still stay where it is. Um, so if you could just put a note in that, that yeah, exactly as you're doing. Maybe that goes up front. That makes sense to me. Um, we'll see when we get to there if, if everyone else is in agreement, but that, I think that's a helpful amendment. Uh, is there anybody else who has preliminary thoughts before we jump in? All right, hearing none, um, Danny, can we go to number one? Sure. All right, so this suite is development of quality assurance standards. Um, which kind of introduces um, what we mean by quality assurance um, and talks about what these systems, um, you know, should include. Um, so let's start with number one. Um, is, is, it's on the screen, everybody can see it. Um, does anybody have comments on recommendation one? I do, this is Russell Wheeler. Hello? Sure, sure. take the floor. It's a, it's a small point, but the uh, report itself towards the end says that uh, agencies should um, collect systematic information detailing the agency's current QA programs. <clears throat> it may be an obvious point, but the report starts right off on the assumption that uh, agencies should consider implementing. Well, the report thought it was important to tell agencies you ought to do a review of what you have and since the, the authors thought it was worth inserting the report, I wonder if it doesn't have some place in the recommendation as well. Um, so it's on page twenty six. Agencies, I'm quoting. Yeah. The, yeah. So, so what, 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 what do you have in mind? Just somewhere a mention to that. This says they consider should consider implementing those. I'm not. I'm not drafting here, but agencies uh, should also collect systematic information detailing the uh, any current Q&A programs they have in place. I don't know, I, it, I really, I, I, it's, it's the author, the, the report author's point. They thought it was worth putting in the report. I just, because of that, I thought I raised the question whether it's worth having in the recommendation. So we have that in, I think, recommendation 18 we or 17, we say that they should periodically assess whether they are, they're working. Um, could we build this into 17? Because I see what you're saying. I think that's a good point. Like they should first assess what they have and then decide whether it's it's working. But I think we already have a nod towards that in 17. Well, periodically assess collect systematic information. Maybe it covers it. Is If the report authors are happy with that, I am too. <clears throat> report authors, consultants, thoughts? So I'll just comment. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we do think that you should assess what you've got before you start building something. And so you've got it in there in two different places, really. I think it would maybe be clearer if you had it a little closer together. Uh, you know, you don't want to start, you know, considering implementing things until you first assess what you have. So I think the point is well taken. Um, but other than that, I do think you've got it captured between those two, between one and 17. I think you do have the, the uh, points are essentially in there. Yeah, so I think it's mostly from the reader's perspective. It seems uh, as if you're starting here from the idea that, that it, it, we're talking about an agency that does not yet have a QA system in place, but of course many agencies do. Um, so I think maybe for the reader, it might be easier uh, to, to at least allude to, to what is in, I forget whether that was paragraph 17 or 
Um, yeah. So it looks like we have a question in the in the queue. What was the question? Aaron, we also have uh, two folks um, uh, who have their hands up. Oh, sure, sure. All right. Yeah. I'm not going to try to mess around with it. I'm going to let you drive. Thank you, Danny. Sure, I'll try. I'm Dan uh, Danny, just one thing. Have you issued a reminder or is anybody not to put substantive comments in the queue? And there's a good reason for it is it defeats transparency because um, we don't record the comments in the queue. So all the comments in the queue should be shared with the committee. Um, so that everybody is privy to them, including especially members of the public. So why don't we go through, Kent, why don't you speak first, and then hi, and then John Kaminsky, you can um, uh, say what you've said in the chat. Sure, so my question just goes to what the intended scope is for when we're actually recommending that, that quality assurance be used. So when I looked at this sentence, I, I stumbled a bit with it because we say you should consider using the, the QA systems when doing so would promote a, a series of goals and they are listed in the conjunctive. So my first question was, should one find that, they, that one needs to further each of these goals before uh, using a QA system, or was this intended to be in the disjunctive, where if you need to improve one of these things, then you should consider a QA system. I would, I would think many agencies, if not all, wouldn't fail at every one of these, but instead it's one mm -hmm. of these issues that they have. But then that also led me to an issue too. When I, when I took them seriatim, and I'm asking, well, should I consider a QA system? I'm pretty hard pressed to figure out when using a QA system would not promote the perception of fairness, uh, whether there's actually an accuracy issue or not. So at the end of the day, I, after reading this about five times, I, I wondered, are we actually telling agencies that they should just implement quality assurance systems and doing so will promote these various goals? Well, I, I guess my reaction to that is, I think we're telling them well, two points. First, I think we could do an and or, which is the ugliest thing in the world. But I think that, that we could do that. But I think we're not telling them that they should um, implement a quality assurance system. We're telling them they should consider implementing a quality assurance system. So if you don't satisfy any of these, I think we would say you have no reason to consider it. But if you do, then you should um, consider it. Um, what doesn't mean you're going to do it, you know, I, I would like them to do so, but they might have resource constraints or something, but they should at least consider it, I think. So I think for my, I'm now speaking as just a member of the committee, not as, you know, the chair I think the consider does the work for us, but I'm happy to listen to other people. Who is next, Danny? Hi. Yeah, I want to pick up on Russell's point because I actually had the same reaction. And I think it may be useful to title review and development of quality assurance standards. Um, and then the first one is agencies should review their existing quality assurance systems, um, maybe even in light of the recommendations noted below. Okay. Um, right, and then sort of second is agencies should consider implementing quality assurance systems. And now again, this practices for assessing and improving, that can go in your first one, right? Should review their existing quality da -da -da systems, that is practices for assessing and improving the quality, blah, 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 because that's the first time you've said it in light of the recommendations above. Right, so the, that is the dash dash that is practices for assessing lines four and five. That should go up into line mm -hmm. two. Okay, it's the first time you've said what a quality assurance system is. Um, and the re two reasons for doing that, yes, we have it in 17 as to then periodically review, but because so many agencies do have them, Right there, you're telling them that this is still a document that's worth their time reading and mm. looking at. Because we're saying review it in light of the recommendations below, and then 
consider implementing when doing so would promote fairness. And then that sort of gets um, a bit to the you know, point of the, is it disjunctive or not? And then you would delete that is practices. I don't, yeah, I see it deleted, sorry, in number two. All right, let, let's keep a pin in this. We'll hear what John has to say and then we'll go and decide whether we're gonna adopt this language. And Thank Aaron, you. I believe Bill Funk, or sorry. Oh, Bill, I'm sorry. Bill Funk is also added to the queue um, as well. But is John next? John, you had a comment in the chat, uh, if you'd like to um, say that. Sure, I, and I think that Claire really addressed it. Uh, my question is, is that, you know, are there agencies that don't have uh, QA systems? I mean, yeah, I, I think that this is really directed towards those that have them to reassess them. And, and I think that the Claire's language captures what I was trying to get at. I think that the idea of creating a QA system from scratch is not something that is widely needed is my guess, but I don't know. I'm gonna throw that question to the consultants. Um, are, are there, I suspect there probably are, but are yeah. there agencies that don't have a quality assurance system? Um, yes. I'll, oh, sorry, Dan. <laughs> no, Dave, go ahead. That's the, that's the correct answer, yes. Um, one of the, I mean, one of the, the challenges is, is the term quality assurance and, and what a quality assurance system is. These are capacious terms. And I think you know, a, an agency may, may uh, suggest that a, you know, a training program counts as a quality assurance program. So part of the, the challenge in answering this question is, is what, what, what do we think it comes within a quality assurance program? Um, that being said, um, I think it's absolutely the case that <clears throat> A number of agencies of which we're aware and with uh, uh, and officials from we spoke don't have the sort of quality assurance programs that we describe in this report that we think are essential uh, to um, uh, measuring quality in a rigorous way. And so, so I, I think it's fair to say I, I, our, our sense is that, that there actually is a fair amount of, of work to be done in a number of agencies in building quality assurance programs. But we, we also believe and, and we're grateful for the comments in this regard. We also think that it's, it's really important and be wonderful for agencies with existing programs to um, assess them in light of some of these principles uh, and, and hopefully report uh, and, and uh, uh, the results of those assessments. Uh, Bill Funk and then Jeff Lubbers. I would suggest deleting when doing so would and, and, and put in place in order to, and that would eliminate the and or issue uh, at the end there. You can leave it as and then. When? Yeah. yeah so you know, it, agencies should consider implementing quality assurance system in order to promote the following goals, essentially? Correct. And, and we're, and we're going to talk about these proposed languages, just get them all out there, and then we'll talk about them. So I think Jeff is next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this is a, maybe an obvious point, but not all agencies are conduct adjudications. Um, this recommendations worded to all agencies. So maybe we should say agencies, you know, that, that have adjudicative programs or something like that. Okay, um, all right. I don't think there's anyone else in the queue. So we have three language proposed changes. Um, we have Chai's, we have um, Bill's, and we have Jeff's, unless I'm missing one. Um, so let's go Chai's first. Uh, adding a review to this section, um, creating a new a new one, and then spinning off what was one into into two. Does anybody have concerns with that? Uh, hearing none, um, I, that's it. That's adopted. Um, let, let's do that change. Mm -hmm. uh, next, we have um, bills which is um, getting rid of the and or problem by get, get, uh, eliminating when doing so and changing it to in order to. Uh, Kent, does that work for you? It works for me if I can just be Jack Bierman for a second and just take off in order, just go right to the infinitive to lose some wordiness. 
All right, does anybody have concerns with that change? All right, hearing none, that is also adopted. Uh, and now we have um, Jeff's point, which is to say that we need to make sure we're talking about agencies that actually do what we're talking about here, um, which I think is a helpful amendment, but who knows if I missed something. Does anybody have any concerns with that language from Jeff? All right, hearing none, that also is adopted. Um, and again, we'll get a chance to go back on this. That's the beauty of the multi-step process. So if um, for those of you who have not worked with one when I've, when I've you know, run the meeting, um, you know, if you wake up tomorrow morning, you're like, oh, darn it, I should have said this, like, you'll get another chance. Um, so just remember those thoughts, keep them down. But for now, let's keep moving on, um, realizing that we'll get a chance to go back to this um, next meeting. Aaron, okay. I I think we have a comment from Bill Funk. Sure. Well, Bill. I just I just thought in number two now, don't we need to say agencies uh, without a quality assurance program or agencies with adjudicative programs that do not have quality assurance systems should consider? Yes, we sh I think we should do that. Um, I, I thought we were maybe we would do that, um, the committee on style between meetings, but I agree. Um, does anybody disagree with that clarification? Okay, hearing that, it's also adopted. Thank you. That's a, that's a helpful amendment. Um, okay, so the new number one that we have, does anybody have concerns with number one? Hearing not number two, we still have the list of things to, that they should consider. Uh, which I think is a pretty good list, but I know that this is a smart group, so maybe we're missing something. Is there another um, characteristic that we're looking for other than fairness, perception of fairness, accuracy, and so on, or one that we would like to uh, like admit it? We don't need to capitalize quality assurance. Great point. Sure. All right, uh, well, I, I bring it up. I know our consultants had mentioned um, in, in comments um, circulated before the meeting that timeliness was not really part of the report. Um, uh, let me say my view on this first, but again, just as a member of the committee, um, I think it's important that even if something's not in the report, if the committee believes that it is true and accurate and useful, we can include it in recommendations. Uh, I think timeliness, ideas of timeliness are important. Uh, I think it's something that they should certainly consider. So my view would be whether or not um, that is expressly addressed in the report. It's still something that as a committee, I think it'd be useful for us to do, but I'm happy to hear thoughts from the consultants or from somebody else if, if we disagree on that. So maybe consultants, it, it, does that make sense to you? So I'll, I'll comment first, I guess. Uh, so with social security, timeliness was actually part of the definition of quality that they use. So I think, you know, it's not a bad idea to, to put it in there. There are, you know, multiple reasons why we did not really start addressing qual uh, timeliness uh, in the report. Uh, because, you know, there's, there's different ways to, to even look at this. And what social security did was, was they focused not so much on, on an average processing time or something like that, but focus instead on not allowing any cases to languish beyond uh, beyond reason compared to the average processing time. So they, they simply set targets that were, you know, 90 days longer than the average or something like that and tried to walk that down. Uh, but, you know, a lot of it uh, really turns on, on budget and, and staffing and changes in the economy and things that really are outside the control of the agency in terms of, you know, if we set actual time limits. <clears throat> so it becomes a problem in terms of even how you define what time this is. But I do think, uh, you know, as they say, justice delayed, uh, justice denied. So time is certainly something that, you know, the committee and, and could, could certainly add in here. Um, I'll just... Just to add, I, I suppose it gives me a little bit of, it makes me slightly uneasy uh, to include timeliness uh, uh, in the list. Uh, I, I like the term efficiency, but, but with timeliness enumerated explicitly, I, I worry a bit that um, a quality assurance program might be deployed uh, in a manner that 
to, it deployed to, to you know, measure how long it's taking to adjudicate claims, you know, to make sure that claims are being adjudicated within deadlines and like my sense, uh, and I won't speak for Dan or Gerald, but my sense is um, that uh, agencies attend to those fairly easily quantifiable metrics um, much more often uh, and more explicitly than they do a harder to measure other other sorts of quality indicia that are harder to measure. And so the concern that I would have is that a, that a explicit enumeration of timeliness as opposed to using the more um, perhaps more capacious term efficiency um, might uh, detract from what I what I, I would like the emphasis to be, which is it was, it was a focus on the harder to quantify, harder to measure, but but equally important um, quality concerns. Danny, do we have anyone else in the queue? Yes, we do. Also, I'll just note that I have dropped in an edit, uh, changing timely to efficient uh, in the red line. And we have, let's see, Bill Funk, Kate Shaw, and Tristan Levitt. Okay, well, Bill? I want to make a real push for keeping timely uh, in there. I mean, if, it, it, as you said, you know, uh, justice delayed is justice denied. And, and it, it may be a metric that's easier to measure, uh, but it's one we shouldn't ignore. And I don't think efficiency captures the idea. Uh, and, and I mean, it could be efficient, take a very long time if you have low resources. But if one of the reasons you're not timely is because you don't have the resources, that, that's, that's something you have to address and focus on. So I think leaving timely in there is, you want to put it timely and efficient manner, terrific. But I, I think it's important to keep timely in there. Kate? Okay. Well, so whether or not it's timely or, or efficient here, I do think that fairness or the perception of fairness should be under three or new four in addition to one. It doesn't seem to be right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that was a drafting choice or just sort of an oversight, but and maybe it's harder to figure out how to frame it, but just, you know, promotes fairness and the perception of apparent uh, of fairness or the appearance of fairness. But I think that belongs there as well. And, uh, and Danny, who is the third person in the queue? Uh, Tristan. Tristan. This, this kind of just piggybacks up what Bill said, but I, I like I like timely as well. I'm not opposed to efficient necessarily, but if only efficient is in there. This is this is kind of really minor, but I, I just timely. If an agency has time, like statutory time limits or anything like that, a timely can capture that. But if adding having only efficient just just feels like it lends itself to just kind of people leaning on people to get things done. You know that sometimes efficiency and quality right are in conflict. So. I, the timely, I feel like captures sometimes just the, the statute will lay the parameters of that. So again, I, I, I whether or not efficient is in there, I, I, you know, advocate to keep timely. All right. Speaking as a member of the committee and not as chair, uh, I agree. I think timely is important to add. I understand the, the concern. Um, that's why I think timely and efficient um, does the trick um, for me. But I think we should keep timely. Um, does anybody who has a who has a vote on this disagree that we should keep timely? Does anybody have a problem with timely and efficient, timely and inefficient, or, or however, the two words together? It looks like um, we have another hand up uh, as well. Sure. Um, Whose is it? I'm sorry, your name on my screen is H22707. I apologize. I'm sorry, this is Alex Manuel. Hello, everybody. Hey, how are you? Uh, okay, uh, yeah, I was, my question went to paragraph two, I, I guess. Uh, so I, I don't have any objection to the uh, bill's suggested change on timely. I think that's a good addition. But uh, going back to two, uh, related to Bill's point, I thought it would be good to list in addition to one of the benefits uh, to actually list to improve allocation of resources might be another benefit for uh, implementing a quality assurance system. All right, um, let's, let's put a pin in that. Let's go to Kate's thought about in four, um, adding fairness and perception of fairness. Um, does anybody have a concern on about that? I don't, I think that makes a lot of sense, but you know, with there's a lot of smart people here. Uh, is that a problem? Do you have any heartburn? 
Okay, hearing none, let's, we'll keep that and let's go back up and look at two, um, adding out, improve allocation of resources. And I guess I will ask the um, consultants, um, is that accurate? Is that true? Um, I, I, it strikes me as intuitive that that is true, but I don't want to say that it's not true. Um, I'll pick Marcus at random. Marcus, is that is that is that true? Um, I, I, it's a, I guess I'm I'm I it helped to to understand a little bit more what what that means more precisely. Um, does it mean help improve allocation of adjudicative resources? Where to distribute adjudicator time and and the yeah, like? I'm thinking uh, if, if there is sort of a review of decisions and. Uh, quality assurance and that sort of thing, uh, which brings me to another point, which is sort of judicial demeanor, if that's some way to be captured through this, but also the way judges handle, uh, for instance, deaf people, people who, you know, you have to bring resources to the adjudication process to be able to understand um, uh, certain petitioners, or uh, there just could be other uh, wheelchairs or, or situations where the judge is going to be able, going to have to handle those situations, and it would be useful if you could capture that in your quality assurance system, uh, in terms of what uh, adjudicative resources are needed. Well, I definitely think that um, some of what we envision, for instance, um, a robust data infrastructure could absolutely account for some of those. Uh, um, issues that 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 occur sort of throughout the decision making process. Uh, so so definitely that that seems consistent with what what we have. Dan or, or Gerald, do you want to um, weigh in? I, I I had the same initial reaction of trying to really understand what notion of of um, allocative efficiency here is, is, is implied by, by the phrase improve allocation of resources, because of course, you know, part of the allocation, if you're talking about, for instance, benefits adjudication is just, you know, ensuring that claimants who are entitled to the benefits receive benefits <laughs> and claimants who are uh, not entitled uh, to the benefits don't receive the benefits. So that's another notion of kind of the allocation of of um, social welfare benefits, but I think uh, the the clarification is helpful. And and I guess one question I would have is whether it's subsumed in a sense about uh, fairness. But maybe one way to think about this is is um, to improve uh, the hearing pro. I mean, I, I'm actually hearing this as like improving the hearing process or or adjudicative resources for um, uh, a fair hearing um, in a sense. All right, Danny, is there anyone else in the queue? We do. Um, we have Russell Wheeler and Hi again. I just worry a bit that we may be loading this, um, this paragraph up with, um, I mean, no disrespect or disagreement, but loading it up almost with a Christmas tree. We could add to this, I guess, um, more effective training programs. The report mentions that. And I wonder if we just should draw, draw the distinction between uh, goals and uh, means and ends. Uh, fairness, uh, accurate, these are all ends. Allocation of resources is basically a means to the end. And whether that's a, that's a way to draw the line about what we, what we do here. We, we might say efficiency and efficient and effective adjudication uh, effective is sometimes a word that people have used to counter the somewhat pejorative notion of efficiency. But I would, um, without disagreeing about the importance of allocation of resources, I'm a little concerned that we may be loading this up with numerous, um, uh, 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 as, I, as I said, uh, uh, means rather than goals. So Russell, I have you a quick question. Dan suggested that maybe this idea is included in fairness or perception of fairness. Um, does that make sense to you? Do you think we've already kind of I, I think it, the I idea? Th No, I, th I think it's probably subsumed under the phrase efficiency. 
Okay. And, and efficient and, and an efficient organization allocates resources effectively. Um, but you agree it's already included in the list. I, yeah, I do. I do. It's okay. a means to the end of efficiency. Okay. Uh, who is next? I is next. So my comment follows really directly from Russell's. It's largely what I was going to say. So I agree with the importance of means to the end. I would not put improve allocation of resources here because obviously you already have promote. So it would have been to promote appropriate allocation of resources. But those that's the, the means to get to some of these ends. So we're saying they should consider implementing these if it will in fact do these things. Okay. I do think it's important in the preamble, maybe an actual other recommendation, that once you have gotten that data as to whether you're not actually creating fairness or efficiency because you don't have enough training, you don't have the right allocation of resources, that's something that you do with the information that you have gotten from your assessment. So not to include it here, but let's definitely hold on to this concept and see that it's reflected elsewhere because I agree with the instinct behind it. Okay. Um, um, Alexander, what do we think? Uh, what's your, what's your uh, response? I, I agree with all the comments that are made. I think it is subsumed largely in fairness. <laughs> Having said that it's one that is a, a mistake that's commonly made, not just by judges, but others as well, where you just have a big hearing and then you, you didn't even ask the question whether someone has uh, needs an interpreter or, or other things. So just in the concept of uh, collecting data and the quality assurance system, it's kind of good to know whether you're sort of complying with that, that need. So that's really why I was presenting the issue. But yeah, I think if it is uh, placed elsewhere, that, that's fine. Okay, so how about this? Uh, I agree, I think it's an important idea. Um, as we go through the list, um, you know, you or all of us pay attention to see if we can find a spot where it fits in and make sure that it's not forgotten. And if not, we'll make sure it's in the preamble or something, but we have to make sure that that idea is in there. Um, okay, so make sure we have a, a, a pin on that, Danny, okay? Yep. Awesome, thank you. All right. Um, I, guess we're, I guess we're, any other re reactions to one or two? If not, let's look at, let's look at three. I'll, I'll give people a time. You can read it real fast, and then we'll we'll take some thoughts. And Aaron, just to um, confirm, this is the new three. Correct, the new three. Um, a quality assurance system should review the work of. Uh, and Russell Wheeler has his hand up. Okay, let's get let's give people another ten seconds to to get their thoughts, and then and then we'll we'll turn it over to Russell. All right, take the floor, Russell. I, 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 I certainly realize, as, as people have said, this is a, a general recommendation directed to a lot of different agencies. But is it possible to give any examples uh, that fleshes out important roles? I mean, I looked in the report, and it, it was not an awful lot more definitive than just important roles. And I wonder if we could say, and, and here I confess my ignorance, really, but uh, personnel assistant evidence decisions, case processes and tasks, such as, and make clear it's not an exhaustive list or anything, but just give some indication of, of uh, who we might be talking about here. Now, the such as would go after tasks. Um, yeah, I understand. Uh, and I, I, I guess I leave, it, I leave it to the report's authors, one, whether it's a, a point worth taking up, and if so, if they could get some sort of generic references so they realize we're not talking here just about judges and law clerks. Does, is there anyone else in the queue? If not, I'll, I'll ask our consultants for a response. No, I, we can go ahead. Okay. Um, one of the three consultants, does anyone want to take a stab at this? Well, I think um, what this is getting at in the report is that you don't want to 
quality assurance system that solely focuses on uh, the, let's say the signatory of an issuing decision like an ALJ when uh, staff attorneys and decision writers may play important roles. What I think is a, a little bit hard in, in terms of coming up with the list of examples is we've also learned of instances where some of the decisional challenges are actually uh, in the actual processing, the issuance of the decision to claimants, where some agencies have a really good just quality control process there to check, to ver verify the address. And, you know, the, the, there are some agencies that have had pretty substantial rates at which uh, claimants are not actually notified of decisions uh, because it was just, you know, the automated uh, kind of address. Um, so, uh, uh, but I guess if I were to take a stab at this and, and, and Gerald and, and, and Dave, feel free to, to, to chime in here, such as, uh, um, uh, such as uh, attorneys who exercise uh, um, uh, uh, drafting uh, discretion and, and support staff, because um, errors can be introduced at those levels. Um, uh, Dave and Gerald, I don't know if you have other language you want to suggest here. Yeah, I guess um, just to make sure that uh... I, you know, the, the, the danger of, a, of providing examples um, yeah. wouldn't want to suggest excluding people. I think Dan, Dan points out a very good example uh, where at, a, at a, what seems like more of a ministerial part of the decision issuance phase, errors get made. And so um, I, I suppose maybe attorneys who exercise drafting discretion and support staff with roles in the development of a record or, or a assembly of other information pertinent to decision making, something like that um, might be helpful. But, but again, say, I, I, such I, as one isolated example, something like that. Just I, I, my advantage here is I come at this without knowing, knowing less than most people on the call about agency adjudication, but it just struck me as I like a little help here about who these people are, other than just people with important roles. Now I'll mute. Aaron, we can also, oh, Bill Funk is in the uh, chat. I just have a question as to whether either the uh, drafters or, or Russell would could think of an interpreter uh, as being somebody who would be uh, included within this quality assurance program, because certainly there's been all sorts of allegations of uh, inaccurate interpretation, uh, interpreters who don't do a good job, and, uh, and that certainly would affect the quality and fairness and everything else. So I just wanted to know if, because that doesn't, what doesn't come out clearly that would include interpreters otherwise. So I'll just comment on that. When, when I worked at Social Security, we actually found that that was an issue with a group of interpreters uh, in one jurisdiction uh, who were essentially, the judge would ask a question, the, the uh, claimant would give a one word answer, and then the interpreter would expound upon it for you know, two minutes or something. And so it was pretty obvious that what they were saying was not a translation of what was being said. And we eventually uh, investigated that and found that they were trying to commit fraud, essentially. So it is important that you have some type of quality assurance over anybody who really who's involved in the uh, in the process. I think we had sort of broad language uh, that we had used, but you know, putting in a few examples is probably a good idea. But it wouldn't be an all inclusive uh, list of people who uh, who you might want to look at. It really depends on you know who's in the agency and uh, and what types of employees that they're using in the adjudicative process. But you do want to look at at the work of all all of the people who are involved. I would say. Aaron, we could uh, leave this to Committee on Style for um, specific people. Yeah, let's do that now. Um, between this meeting and next meeting, uh, we'll huddle up with the consultants and we'll come up with a few representative examples and we'll make sure that, it, that we're saying that it's not an exhaustive list. So that's something that we can do between this meeting and next and we'll run that language by the, by the committee. All right, so beyond that, any other thoughts on three? Thank you, Russell. All right, hearing none, um, let's go on to number four, which you've already looked at. Um, so beyond what we've already added to four, um, does anyone else have thoughts, uh, things that we should add, subtract, change on four, the new four? And Bill, do you have, still have your hand up or is that just, okay. 
Um, it looks like we have two people, uh, Robert Gerard and then Jeff Lubbers. Robert. Uh, yeah, um, in the new E is consistent across all adjudications. I think that it might be better to say is consistent across all adjudications of the same type. And yeah, yeah, Robert, keep going. And I guess one other, you know, in light of, of the discussion about where do you fit in accessibility, uh, the availability of an interpreter, access to a wheelchair, and so on, um, do we want to add a new F is consistent with diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility goals? Or, or some formulation like that, to, to, because you know, I think we're hearing some significant concerns about how part of a quality assurance system is is to ensure that uh, that individuals are are getting uh, access or getting information as part of the hearing process. So, I, I guess I have a question on that, maybe for the consultants. I, obviously, we're you know those are good things, and I'm not opposed to any of them. But is that something that a quality assurance system can do? Um, or is that a different type of concept that we are incorporating here? Well, I think um, Dave has, has uh, took a stab at it earlier, which is it, it is the case that once you've built out the kind of case management system that contains this kind of information, it is possible to run these kinds of reports as to whether there are differences in adjudicatory outcomes across types of claimants um, uh, based on whether they have legal representation, based on whether uh, uh, they have an interpreter uh, or whatnot. So it is in principle possible to do that kind of uh, analysis. We have not uh, seen a, 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 a number of we haven't really seen agencies utilize it quite to that extent, but uh, the data infrastructure would certainly uh, permit it. Gerald, I don't know if you have any other uh, uh, thoughts along those lines from the SSA perspective. Uh, it really has to do with uh, what data you're capturing. So if you capture data on, you know, it includes interpreters and includes, uh, you know, race, age, uh, sex appointments, and so on. Uh, you can you can tease out all kinds of information. There's massive amounts of information that's captured, but you may or may not be capturing all that information. For instance, SSA uh, was not capturing information on race, so it would be difficult then to tease that out. And you certainly can't uh, guess based on someone's name or where they live, even. Uh, so you know, it really depends on what you're capturing in terms of what you can do. But you know, it's pretty easy to capture and store the information. It doesn't cost much to store information doesn't actually cost that much more to build in additional things into a case management system to capture the information. So it's really more of a policy choice by the agency in terms of what data they wanna capture. And then once doing that, you can, you can slice and dice the, the data any number of ways. Okay. Um, can I see the language again? Um, maybe everyone, everyone else can see it, but it's, it's disappeared from my screen. No, I, it's actually my fault. I'm, um, I, my word is giving me the uh, wheel of death at the moment. Uh, oh, no. Or why? Um, so I may have to restart my word, um, uh, but we can capture this language uh, and my colleague, Matt Gluth can also capture it in red line. Um, but Aaron, could I possibly suggest since we're about the breaking mark anyways, do you mind if we take um, our break now as opposed to in about eight minutes? Sure, let's take a break now. That would be helpful. And then we can also think, uh, use language that we've used. If we're going to do this idea, use language you've already used before so we're not recreating the wheel. Um, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Let's take can a break. I, yeah, I'll flag that Jeff Lubbers has his hand up. Sure, Jeff, you'll have the floor when we come back. Let's take a break until we have our, our working computer. All right. Okay, well, everybody, we're coming back. Um, and we left with, um, Jeff had his hand up, but the idea for F here was we we're gonna do something about accessibility to make sure that we are, are capturing that idea. Uh, I, I don't know if that's Jeff's comment or he has something else, but either way, Jeff, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, no, I was just gonna try to shorten the little paragraph after that um, to say, um, rather than 
repeating, you know, factually accurate, legally compliant to say whether decision making is meeting the above goals. Do you mind? Line, line 22. Aaron, before we get to line 22, can we go back to line 20 on accessibility just so I can sure. capture the language? And then it looks like um, Hi also has a comment after Jeff's comment. Yes, yeah, so who's, I don't remember whose language um, suggested accessibility. Was it Robert Gerard? Yeah, uh, yeah that was mine. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a, a quick repeat of, or an approximation of what you said? Uh, well, I, I said uh, it is consistent with um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility goals. But, you know, as this discussion has gone on, I think an alternative could be to flesh this out in the preamble that what do we mean by fairness? What do we mean by meets substantive and procedural requirements? I mean, fairness includes decisional fairness, but also uh, understandable decisions that people can comprehend. Um, meeting procedural requirements does include meeting uh, accessibility requirements, including reasonable accommodation requirements. It, it also uh, yeah. requires accurate appeal notices and so forth. So I'm wondering if, so that we don't um, make things more confusing and maybe uh, bury the substance, uh, I'm wondering if it might be better to, to to deal with this in a more straightforward way in the preamble. I like that idea. Okay, who, who, has, the, who has the floor, Danny? Uh, I believe, uh, hi, did you so, have something well, to say? So I don't think you addressed my, my, my comment, which, mm -hmm. which is on line 22. Which, uh, Jeff, is, is hi, is it your point about this line on, on line 20, or is it something different? It, it was on line 20. And the reason oh, I ahead. lowered go my ahead. head was just, I was gonna make the point that the accessibility piece you have in the substantive and procedural requirements, but I thought spelling that out in the preamble was good. And then uh, I was agreeing with Robert's own amendment to his suggestion about putting it in the preamble. So I lowered my hand, okay. but- All right, thank you, thank you. All right. Um, well, how about this? Let's let's do this before we get to the other. Um, is there anybody opposed to doing this in the preamble rather than adding it to this um, part of the recommendation? All right, hearing none, we're gonna put that in the preamble um, and then we'll get another chance to look at it. So if we wanna change our mind, we can do that. But for now, let's do the preamble. For next time we come back, we'll have that. Perfect, thank you. All right, Jeff, the floor is now yours. Thank you for your patience. No problem. No, I was just going to say on line 22, or now it's 23, um, whether decision making um, is meeting the above goals. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Um, does anybody disagree with that? And then get rid of all of the re repeat. All right, does that give anybody heartburn? If we're all in person, I look around you the room. You eliminated too much there. there. You eliminated too much. Yeah, no, yeah, after, yeah. We, after consistent. Oh, correct. We want we want to keep. Um, right. Is me yeah. the above goals? Delete all of those things and then start yep. comma agencies should be mindful. Mm -hmm. And I think the consultants had a comment on this, the last 11 words of this. Okay. Um, one of the three consultants, um, I can just pick on one. I can just call on somebody random, but I, I assume that one of you is the more natural person for, for this. Or I will call on Dan at random. <laughs> All right, Dan. <laughs> I don't remember actually which one of us uh, uh, noted that comment. So I'm just trying to go back uh, to the the comments here. Um, oh, I think uh, uh, Gerald uh, Gerald's power has been going in and out. Gerald, I think you were you were noting this uh, that this might just structurally fit better under timing and process 
uh, sections eight and nine. Uh, is is that um, uh, am I catching that right, Gerald? Yeah, it's really sorry, just, just a, a structural here. Uh, comment here on, on where this language belonged. Yes. So sorry, my Zoom and my power went out the house. So I called in on the telephone, and uh, yeah, so that was kind of what I was thinking was that so it's sort of a standalone idea there, and I thought it just fit better elsewhere. All right, so that's correct. Do you have a, a, a proposed place where you'd like to put it? Um, well, if I could, I, I'm having a hard time actually looking at anything. So I'm trying to get my, my internet down to my computers are down. I think under, so, under the passages of timing of and process for quality assurance review, so that language could be moved uh, since it's really uh, um, uh, more about the the kind of procedural uh, uh, part of this under uh, it could be moved under I think eight or nine. Yeah, I thought it fits sort of under nine. Okay, here's my proposal for this, Danny. Put a pin in this, and between this meeting and next, uh, we will talk with the consultants and we'll see if there's a place that it makes sense, and then we'll propose it to the committee rather than everyone trying to figure it out right now on the fly. That sounds good. And uh, Russell Wheeler has his hand up. Sure. Russell. Yeah, I noticed the same point that the consultants, it's, it seemed out of place there. But I think the point, I think the point the recommendation writers are trying to get at was something like, like this, that um, reversal or remand rates, uh, you, can, you can't rely on reversal or remand light rates as, as an indication of quality because of the uh, the uh, unrepresentativeness of cases that gets appealed. That seems to me to be worth keeping here. I, I, I think that's what the, what the recommendation, those who wrote the recommendation were trying to get at. I thought it was a little hard to decipher, but if that's the point, I think it's worth, it's worth, um, it's worth keeping. Agents should be, should be mindful that, um, that, that, re, that re, reversal rates or remand rates um, well, re re remand rates are, are not a, a, an adequate m measure of quality uh, because uh, you know appeals may not reflect representative sample of all adjudications. I think that's what they were trying to get at. If I'm wrong, then we can strike the whole thing. But maybe the re no, representation no, writers would like to come. No, no, that that is what the what they were trying to get at. Um, the question is if it has to be here in addition to the other place. Um, or because it's also going to be in the preamble too. Remember, there's a, a third piece of this that we haven't seen yet. Um, you know what? Like I said, look, look, I, I, your point is well taken, Russell. Let's put a pin in this and we'll circle back with actual language we can look at on, on, on next meeting. And Aaron, uh, Alexander Manuel also, Manuel has his hand up. Sure, Alexander. Yes, um, the I don't know if this was beyond the scope of the committee or not. Uh, certainly, it's, it covers everything comprehensively with regard to decision making. That's obviously very important. But of course, a big part of what judges do, I don't know if you intend to capture this or not, is the uh, responsibility for building an appropriate record. And I'm not sure that's captured by some of these goals here. That it, whether it's the uh, in, interpreters and the making sure that the courtroom accommodates blind people and others. In general, the judge has a responsibility for building an appropriate record and managing the case uh, as it goes through. And, and the, the decision obviously would reflect the extent how that was handled by the judge. So I just would sort of put that out there as a general concern that uh, the judge's responsibility for managing the hearing and building the record are things that might want to be taken into account. Is that not included within substantive and procedural requirements? Uh, yes, but again, it's kind of like the other point is that, you know, it's not a substantive law in terms of what a law applies in the case, and it's not the procedure in terms of the, of the federal rules of procedure. Uh, it, is, it is sort of um, uh, other due process dictates that would apply to the proceeding that the judge is responsible for overseeing, essentially. And I don't know if you want to raise that issue or not. So I hear what you're saying. Um, is there a word that we could put in that, that list that uh, broadens it so it's not just substantive and procedural, but it includes something, else, this extra that you're talking about? 
I don't know what, what that word is. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, 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 I guess um, if it were me, and, and we, we, it's the word, the term is overused, but it, it really is the essence of what they do. It's sort of uh, basically uh, all uh, due process considerations. Uh, you know, the person is entitled to have to, to due process, which is the substance, it is the procedure, and it's also the way in which the hearing is conducted. I mean, I guess my reaction is, and, I, and I'm probably an outlier, is I would include the procedural due process that you're talking about within procedural requirements. I don't think procedure is just um, like the steps before the hearing. I think it would include how the hearing is conducted. And if due process requires it, I think it's included in the procedural requirements, or if not that, in fairness and appearance of fairness. But I, I get your point that you know, procedure is a word of too many meetings. Um, I don't know, do, do folks have an idea here for a word that maybe does this or do we think procedure does the trick? I'm yeah, throwing it out here now for, for, for the wisdom of the group. Yeah, so it's not the federal rules of evidence. It's not the federal rules of civil procedure. It's just, you know, rules Correct. that would apply. Yeah. Correct, so, but, but due, due process um, is also a procedural requirement. If it's constitutional due process, if it's just like good, like small D, um, small P due process, like just good fairness stuff. Um, that's right, that's, maybe that's not picked up by a requirement. Um, what, what do folks think? Wisdom of the group, do we have a word here or do we think procedure does it? I and Bill Funk both have their hands up. How about all legal requirements instead of substantive and procedural? All applicable legal requirements. Mm -hmm. But. To add to that, I think our issue here more is the term decision-making in line 14, okay? Because decision-making can be accurate, right? Can promote fairness, um, as a, right? As opposed to the, as Alex was saying, um, the, uh, the overall process, okay? So there's the ultimate decision, but then there is the process right, which is, there are other procedural requirements. So I would say I'm not exactly sure that we can wordsmith it here. I think that if we send back this idea and say what we want in 14 is something that will include both the decision, ultimate decision, and the process, the adjudicatory process. That's the decision-making process. Yes, but the problem is, um, it, look, when you read that, to assess whether the decision-making process is accurate, given the facts of the individual matter, no, that's the actual decision being accurate. And, and it is really true that you, there are two things you want to see in terms of these adjudications. Number one, are they getting it right? And it makes you crazy when they're not getting it right in terms of the facts. And, you know, and then are they completing it in a timely manner? Are they making sure they're giving the accommodations? You know, um, so yeah, it's whether the decisions and the decision-making process. The, the one thing I still wanna hand back for someone to look at before our next meeting is, sh should we pull this out a little more clearly? You know, whether the decisions are doing this and whether the decision-making process is doing that. I I'm not sure, but that's more than I think we can wordsmith right here. You could say promotes accuracy if you didn't want to say is accurate. I'd like it to be accurate. Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you the number of federal sector decisions I read. I'm like, excuse me? So enough on that. Um, okay. I, I'm going to, before we move ahead, um, does anybody disagree with that recommendation to see if we can um, make it sing a little bit better between this meeting and next? All right, hearing no objections, we're gonna do that. Um, Lena Olson has her hand up. Oh, great. Yeah, hi, I joined late, so, um, but I, when I read decision-making processes, I think that relates to the adjudicator. I don't see in that word the other participants, namely the claimant, 
the beneficiary. So I'm not really happy with that. I don't feel like that reflects the wholeness of the process that, you, you know, to go back to the due process comments, that the focus is not on the other participants and whether they're getting due process. So what type of language? I don't think? know. I need to think about that. But I'm seriously, I'm thinking about that. I'm just making that point. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I'm at a disadvantage here because my instinct is that um, uh, Kate's suggestion that we add promotes fairness and appearance of fairness is number one, I think does capture those concerns. So I'm not quite seeing what, what, what I'm missing. Um, but I understand that I'm missing something. So let's let's do this. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go back on the committee of style and come up with something. Uh, Nina, if you have thoughts or anybody else, if you have thoughts, um, feel free to um, reach out and, and share them um, so we can kind of incorporate that now. But it seems like this is a bigger idea than we're going to be able to do here on the fly. Unless someone has an easy an easy fix, which maybe somebody your, does. Hi, you had your hand up, but I don't know if you put it down already. I, I put it down to simply reinforce. I I had it up to say, <laughs> you know what? You're exactly right, but this is why we're sending it back because this is more complicated than can be done right now. But these there are two very specific things we want to get at. You know, we want to get at the decision itself. We want to get at the process, although we might not want to call it the decision-making process. It might be something that more captures the overall structure. So I think we've given folks, and I'll, if I have an idea, of course I'll send them, but um, I think we've given folks the, the, the concept here, and then we'll, yep. we'll see what folks come back with. And Bill Funk? I have a general observation, listening to all the comments and the changes that we've been making to the original uh, proposed recommendations. The report of the consultants is all focused on the accuracy of the decision and the processes of the decision making, the decision making process that go to accuracy. Uh, and, and really that's why the idea of timeliness didn't really come into the, the, uh, uh, the consultants report because that didn't go to the accuracy of the decision. Uh, and, and so all the quality assurance stuff in the report is about making sure that the decisions are accurate and well done and good, uh, come out right, uh, as opposed to all the kind of fairness notions that we've been putting into the, into the recommendation now. Now, I'm in favor of broadening the recommendation uh, in this way, I mean, as Aaron originally stated, as long as the committee feels that you know, we can go beyond the, the consultant's report, we can. Uh, but I, I just want us all to sort of be aware uh, that we are we are going beyond the, the consultant's report in all of these things that just what Hai was just talking about, the processes, not just in terms of getting an accurate decision, but the processes in terms of fairness, uh, perceptions of fairness, and uh, the, the sense that things are being done in a way that includes people and makes them feel good. So it's just a general observation that we should be aware of what we're doing. And Erin, uh, Nina has her hand up as well. And I'll just note too, for uh, the good of the committee, um, these recommendations are obviously drafts and the report that we circulated is also a draft and the consultants will finalize their report uh, by the end of the third committee uh, session. Nina. So I, I maybe one way to approach this just as in the preamble, we're going to describe what we mean by fairness is to, in the preamble, describe what we say when we use the words decision-making processes so that it can incorporate what I've called the wholeness of the, you know, the process from different perspectives. Yeah, make sure we catch it and capture that idea. No, I was talking to Danny there. I, I agree with that. I think that, that that will be helpful. Okay. 
Uh, all right, so I'm looking at this. Is there anything else we wanna add to the list um, or do we think that it works? We're subject to that we're gonna clarify what we mean in the start of for uh, decisions and decision-making process. Put all that aside, the actual list that we have, um, does that do the trick for people? Any, any heartburn? I'm assuming not, I don't hear any. Uh, let's go on to the next one. All right, and the next one is our next suite, which is quality assurance personnel. Um, and let's just, I'll give people a second to, to look through the, the entire suite and then we'll go to start looking at what is now number five, but just take a second, make sure you know what we're looking at so you see how all the pieces fit together. Okay, let's get started with number five. I, I don't know who's in the queue. Does anybody have any thoughts on number five? The disadvantage of doing Zoom, Zoom is great in many ways. The disadvantage is I can't look around the room and just see, <laughs> see, see from people's faces uh, who would like to take a stab at it. Um, is there anybody in the queue, Danny? I don't see anyone at the queue in the queue at the moment. Good, uh, all right, let's move on to number six. Um, people will get a chance to go back, but let's move on to number six then. Um, any concern with number six? Hearing none, um, this is great. All right, let's go on to number seven. Good job, ACUS staff. Wait, wait okay. until these ones out of the park. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's let's look at number eight here. This is this is this has oh, never wait. happened before. Russell Russell Wheeler. Sure, Russell. A very small point. Uh, the word they probably should be two. Should consider whether to assign. As it's written, it means they should contemplate the status quo. I think it means they should. It's it's they should consider whether to do something, not whether to do, not whether what they do now. What line number are you looking at? Line 36, agencies should consider whether to assign personnel. Oh, yeah, yeah, I agree. So on line, on line 36, um, we it. have a they, and that should be a two. Got it. Yep. Right, thank you. And hi. Yes, and not to disappoint you about having some <laughs> stuff right on this. I actually think all of this is... Excellent, right, Ona? But I think one of the hardest things for agencies to figure out is who should be these personnel? And especially if they're smaller agencies, whether it's worth it to them to allocate resources to that, mm -hmm. okay? As opposed to in the larger agencies, yes. So um, that doesn't have to be anything here, but I think that's very important to put in the preamble um, together with some suggestions of... <laughs> Here's how to think about the type of people you want doing this quality assurance, especially to make sure as we have on lines 32 and 33 that they're not gonna have repercussions from the folks they review. Um, so I would keep all this as is, but absolutely say something in the preamble about the utility for even small agencies to really think about identifying people to do this particular job. And uh, Jim Tozy also has hey, Jim, take the floor. Oh, yeah, I have a, just a question. This brings up the point. Uh, there was a, move, uh, a motion to strike one of the previous sections, and we're, we're going to revisit it. And I'm asking whether it's here or it's going to be later, that, that, that section that was written, and they said we're going to reconsider it at a later time. Danny, do, do you know which one we're talking about? Yeah. I think there's one that Ms. Feldman 
suggested. It was earlier in the, in the, in the thing. We brought it up and they said we were going to reconsider it. Yeah, it wasn't me, but it was about that. Don't assume that from your review of what gets appealed, that that's going to be. Oh, you know, yes, yes, it. yes. And I so thought that's in so the timing and process. Someone, whoever raised it, it wasn't me, as I said, was saying in the timing and process might be where. Correct. 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 So is it, is it in, well, is, uh, I, this one raises that question. Is the original text is written still in the document now? Yes. Okay. I have no, all right. I, I believe it is. Well, we're, yeah, the question is, um, you can't just look at the results of appeals and then say, and general, and, and make that, you know, generalized findings about everything because right. the cases that are appealed are, you know, idiosyncratic, but possibly. So that idea is definitely going to be in here. We have it currently in the first section. Um, the consultant's idea was maybe we put it in this section or maybe we right. put it in both. But we're going to figure that out between this meeting and next, and we're going to bring it to everybody to look at and see what we did. Okay. No, that's it. Thank you. And Jeff Lovers. Jeff. Yeah, and I guess I was concerned we were going too fast. <laughs> uh, so in, in, the, in the new eight, um, the, the second and third sentences are technically they're not really recommendations, but I guess I guess it fleshes out the first sentence. So I guess it's okay, but um, I'm, I'm not sure we need the first May. You know, I think per personnel who perform quality assurance on a permanent basis, I mean, yeah, they, they gain experience. I mean, it's not that they may gain. Um, maybe the second May is is okay, but uh, yeah. So what we did here on this one is the others are saying our shoulds that they should like do these things. Yeah. This one is consider. So that's why we put the relevant material that, that would be relevant to that consideration. Um, so that's why it's a little bit different than the others in the list. Yeah. Um, but I agree with you on the May, like <laughs> by definition, you gain experience right. by doing something. <laughs> that's all. I'm Bill Funk. Bill Funk, take it, Bill. It, it's, it's sort of a follow on to Jeff's idea that the second and third sentences really aren't necessary uh, because they, they don't, they aren't part of the recommendation, but more importantly, from my perspective, is they're in, incomplete, uh, both in terms of pros and cons. Uh, and it's all, it's all spelled out in the report at some length, and, and therefore I have no, no problem with, with what's in the report. But it just, and I don't have a real problem with this language here either, but I think it's seriously under-inclusive of both pros and cons of what should be considered and, in, in, you know, which personnel, how to, to do this. So what is your thought? We could do it two ways. We could either make it more or we can make it less or we can leave it as is. Well, what is uh, your preference? I don't want to make it more because then that becomes much too much and less recommend recommendatory. Uh, I'd either say take it out uh, as just unnecessary. If people want to know what the pros and cons are, then they should look at the, at the report or put it in the preamble. This preamble uh, is going to be 100 pages long. <laughs> yeah. I also um, has her hand up. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so um, I'm glad we're talking about this because I think this is going to be something that may apply to various places. Um, I, I do think it's better to not have it here, largely because I think it is also under-inclusive, um, and to have something like, not necessarily preamble, so I'm putting this out here, I, I think there is utility at various places. For example, if it's said here, I should consider whether to assign parens, C pros and cons in appendix, you know, or paragraph three of the appendix. So I, I, I know this is a bigger issue. Okay, so I'm just putting out because I know we have as ACUS just the preamble than the recommendations. But as I think about implementation and having agencies actually do these things, the more we can give them things in bite sizes, the better. Um, and this is really a big thing to think about. Do you want these to be permanent, folks? Do you want them to be temporary? And we have a lot of good thoughts in the report, but they're not going to read all of that. And I'm not sure we can even 
give it the right do in a preamble. So I just want to put out as a thought, besides whatever we might say in a preamble, that we have it in a very clear pros and cons somewhere. Hmm. So to answer this, it would be yes, take it out from here. And we decide whether we're referring people back to the preamble or we are referring them to something else we have created for them. It comes up in the next recommendation too. Same issue. Yep, and it's gonna come up in a number. Can I just jump in here on the, uh, uh, Hi, your, your, uh, your suggestion of an appendix is, uh, strikes me as um, a good idea. It's certainly not inconsistent in any way with ACUS practice, but the main point I would wanna make is, and I, I, like, the, I like the way you phrase it in terms of bite-sized pieces. What I, what I strongly recommend against is referring back to the preamble in the recommendation um, and, and also having a, a um, continuing to um, uh, sort of relegate things to the preamble, which um, uh, draws, often draws a lot of objection from not only the, our council, but also our members. And um, anyway, that, that's, that's my general comment, but I think your point is very well taken. And I don't think there should be any reluctance to uh, including a, appropriately prepared and persuasive appendix, as long as it's not too long. That's my opinion. So, yeah, so my, my, speaking now as a member, not as committee chair, um, I hate it. I hate appendixes, <laughs> appendices. Um, I think they get kind of confusing. Um, but that said, we've done it before. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm Berkey in enough that if we've done it before, we can do it again. Um, so I think, I think that works, um, for now, well, let me kind of, I wish I could get a straw poll. If I could just look around the room, I would say who thinks, who likes it as it is, who thinks we should, um, delete it. Um, and if we think you should delete it, what should, what should we do? So first, let me just say, is there anybody who likes it as it is? Aaron, we could kind of do a tally of hands up. Can we do that? Yeah. Let's do that. Let's do a straw poll. Uh, who likes it as it is? So we've got at least Jim Tozy. I think your hand is still up. No, that's that was from my last question. No. Okay. So Russell Wheeler, his hand is up. All right. Who does not like it? Who thinks we should delete it? Bill Funk. Hi, Nina, Alexander, Tristan. Well, that sounds like a, a, a pretty strong majority um, to delete it. So if we delete it, what, what should happen next? Um, so assuming this is gone, um, do we want this? I think this could be a, a paragraph in the preamble uh, or do we want to add an appendix? So who thinks that a preamble would be helpful? Let's do a straw poll on that. If you think his preamble could solve this problem, show of hands. We have Jeff and Russell and Hi. And Aaron, I might note just because Hi, your, your comment earlier was about multiple sections, it might be helpful to ask this question at the end so that we know how many, you know, how much information we're putting in the appendix versus the preamble. Um, as another option. Yes, thank you for that. And that's why I, I raised my hand to your question. Um, e um, Aaron, even though I don't think that the preamble necessarily um, takes, is that you said fully solves it. And yeah. I, would, I think we should think about things that should be in the preamble, right? After we have that, per Matt's point, we look at the preamble and the recommendations and say, is there anything... <laughs> that really should not just be in the preamble, that it actually needs to be, okay? Separate from those two, I think we think about, and I actually don't feel the need to even call it an appendix or whatever, but it's what I call the bite-sized checklist, uh -huh. pros, cons, that our entire focus for that document is accessibility by the agency staff that we want to be implementing this. So, that is not substituting for the preamble. You know, it is after we have preamble recommendations, 
let's say in the preamble, we note some pros and cons of permanent versus temporary, but we have a lot of other stuff in the preamble, right? Then when there's some other document that says, as you're going through and you're now implementing, we've pulled out for you. And here are the pros and cons to this. And as Jeff noted, there'll be other places. Here's the considerations for that. So that's why I'm raising my hand on saying, take it out here, put it in preamble, but that's not precluding us at the end, coming up with something else. And as we go through things, identifying what we might want to also have in a quote unquote appendix or something else. All right. Um, again, now I'm speaking as me, not, 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 not as the moderator of, of the room. I don't know, like that seems, I've seen appendices before where we say, um, this is how some agencies do their websites. So here's an example so you can see what we're talking about. Um, this feels like we're giving substantive advice, not just like a reference you can understand. Well, that feels like it should either be a recommendation um, or it should be something else. But if we're like, let's just make a, a bigger recommendation. It seems kind of strange to me that we're adding um, something that feels like not, not just an example, but actual analysis. It feels like that that's a, as a recommendation to me. Um, now, maybe I'm wrong, but have we done a appendix like that, like a substantive appendix before? I think maybe Reeve could speak to this better than I can. We have done appendices that sort of take the form of um, checklists um, and things like that, that uh, identify considerations that ag agencies might want to account uh, for. I think rules on rulemaking was one. Um, I, I sort of, I, I think the, 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 my own view on this is sort of whether, whether something should appear in an appendix depends on what the appendix is exactly going to look like. I don't know that we really know that at this point. Reeve, do you, um, can you sort of draw on some of our past precedents to answer the question about when we use appendices? other than to illustrate, say, how particular agencies do things? Yeah, I think rule on rulemaking probably is the closest analogy. I mean, the only other examples I can think of is, is where we've had appendices, like with screenshots of, yeah. of actual things. Uh, you know, like I think we did that in the rule uh, adjudication materials recommendation. Rule on rulemakings, as Matt mentioned, was sort of more checklist-like, you know, here are some possible things that you might consider to put in your rule on rulemakings. Um, so those are the two examples I can think of. Like Matt, I guess I'm not sort of sure sort of what exactly it would look like, but hopefully that's helpful in terms of sort of precedent from what you can draw. Um, okay. Okay. Um, this feels like a bigger thought also. Um, let, let's talk about this um, between this meeting and next, and we'll see what we can come up with. Um, I hear your thought, but this would be helpful for me, for everybody who is on the pro, call it appendix, call it, you know, whatever we want to call it, that side. If you could identify what exactly from the recommendations we would put in there, that would be helpful for us to know, uh, to decide if it's, if it's worth doing as a standalone thing, or if we can weave it into the, what we already have. So as we go through the process, think about that uh, and flag things that would fit in, in what we're talking about. Let's call it appendix and scare quotes. Um, what would fits into that? And then we'll have a sense if it makes sense to do that or if we should just do it the recommendations. Does, well, that, does that work as a, as a process point? Yeah, Aaron, can I just add um, also things that aren't in the recommendation that maybe should you, you feel um, should be there in this kind of appendix or checklist or another recommendation itself? Uh, hi, does that work for you? I, I want to make sure that uh, I'm <laughs> playing fair with you. Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, these comments are really coming from me co-chairing now this new ad hoc <laughs> committee on implementation and really talking with my other two co-chairs about putting into during our deliberative process here thinking about what could be helpful to make sure that all the work we've done here gets used okay so it's absolutely a bigger issue which is also why i want us to answer things within our current process right preamble recommendation you know but also keep in mind some new ideas that we might want to do 
and and that so this what you just said is yep. exactly right. All right, sounds good. So let's let's try to get to the next suite and see if we can. We have twenty minutes. Let's see what we can get out of the next suite. I would like to get at least halfway through. So when we pick it up again on our next meeting, um, that we, you know, that we're <laughs> that we see the end of the project. Um, so let's let's see what we can get here with our next suite. Um, if you can scroll it up so we can kind of see the suite here. And I want everybody to kind of look at it and then you know take a take a minute to just kind of read everything and then we'll we'll go back to going one by one. To the extent that we can. Maybe that's hard to do because this one is just kind of across pages. Yeah, unfortunately I can't quite. I can put it down. Um, that may not be worth it. And does it end at 10 or is it? So another suggestion, I think it was from, hi, originally was on, or originally we had uh, these two recommendations below data collection as part of the section, but- um, and but, really but to call it out it's on its own its own suite. Yeah. Okay, all right, that's, that, that's good. Okay, so let's look what we have now with number nine. Um, does anybody have comments on number nine? Think Jim Tozy and Bill Funk. All right, Jim. No, I. That's an old hand. An old hand. Okay, great. <laughs> Bill that's Funk. A, it's like my old hands, but still. <laughs> uh, I, I have a real problem with uh, at least the second sentence here, uh, in terms of. I don't. It's not clear to me. It, you have a. You've had a hearing before an ALJ. The ALJ is for testimony. Testimony by the by the applicant, the claimant, and then he goes back in the back room, uh, comes up with a draft decision, and some some uh, uh, quality assurance person comes in and says, "Well, I think I think actually you should. It, it, this is a mistake. You shouldn't you shouldn't grant it. You should deny this." and uh, the administrative law judge says, oh, yeah, thank you for pointing that out to me. Uh, thanks for that help. That's pretty unlikely, too. But in any case, then comes up with a final decision that denies the, the, the claim. And we've had a decision that's been made in a back room by somebody who wasn't even present at the hearing and, and didn't hear the testimony. And that seems to me just absolutely wrong. I don't see how that could possibly be uh, an appropriate way of proceeding. Uh, so I just don't. I, it's difficult for me to understand how you would do quality assurance for draft decisions, right? I mean, this is quality assurance is an after the fact thing. It's not a before the fact thing to, at least I don't think that's the process we're talking about here uh, is trying to decide, have a, 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 sim, a semi review, a mid-level review before the decision is even decided. So if that's what was involved here, I, I have real problems. I think this feels like a good question for the consultants. Um, is there one of them who would like to respond to Bill? Uh, yes. Uh, so a couple uh, different ideas here. So one, uh, so security has used uh, uh, artificial intelligence to do this type of review. So we're not talking about a quality assurance review or some guy in the back room. Uh, they use technology to basically look over the decision and find errors. And that is helpful to the judges to, uh, to see that they've made some, you know, common drafting error or you know made some mistake in the timing of something or or miscited a regulation or something uh, so there's that aspect of it the other aspect i think you do run into an issue of uh of the uh you know decisional independence of the judge if you've got someone else you know stepping in and telling them what decision to make i don't think that really is what we're intending uh but this goes to two different types of review so one is something sort of like that an insight tool that so security uses the other is you know, it says during a period when appellate agency appellate review is available. And so what we're talking about there is sort of, uh, you know, the, the agency still has an opportunity to uh, address the issue and correct the decision rather than uh, having to wait and use some type of reopening rule or, or maybe even uh, have, having forfeited the right to reopening of the case. So there's sort of two different thoughts there. And, you know, arguably it could be maybe drafted a little bit differently, but I, I think, you know, having tools, uh, uh, AI tools in particular that can assist the adjudicator is probably something that most judges would welcome. They don't want to make mistakes. And if there's something that would uh, that would be pretty obvious, but they didn't catch, 
uh, they probably wouldn't would like having a tool that, that assisted them in that way. So I think those are the two sort of ideas that I think are encompassed here. One is to have these types of tools and the other is uh, making corrections while the agency still has uh, the, the time and the authority to do so. Is that helpful? Can, I, can I respond to that? Sure. Uh, I mean, I certainly have no problem with the idea of having the uh, ALJ be able to uh, use their artificial intelligence thing. It seems to me that's just a fancy shepherdizing. Uh, it's just it's a it's a it's a function of the research you're doing. You know, it's it's a check on making sure that jeopardizing that your site is still still an accurate site. Uh, your AI tells me, oh, look at this policy that I've gotten wrong here. Uh, that doesn't seem to me what the quality assurance review is all about. I mean, it's it's the review is a review of something and some. Uh, it's I don't see it as being used by the judge when they're talking about quality assurance review. It's something done by the agency. To review the stuff, uh, but I mean, if you if you want to include this kind of situation of using stuff that has been developed by the agency for the the use of the decision maker, uh, I think it just needs to be drafted a lot differently. Because certainly, when I read this, it, and it certainly as it's written, would include backroom person talking to. Them. Could I could I um, add just a way in? Sure, but also. Have the floor. Yeah, just to add to, to what Gerald mentioned. So, so Gerald identified a couple of uh, uh, pre-effectuation types of, of quality review that we're aware of that we think are important. But, but there's another type as well. Um, this is either peer review or supervisory review. Uh, this is common and I think relatively uncontroversial that before a, a, like an attorney advisor's decision goes out, um, a supervisor reviews it, um, maybe even a couple levels of supervisory review to make sure that that decision is uh, is is accurate. It, it engages with the evidence in, a, in, a, in an acceptable way, and, and so forth. And so, I think that that's another type of. I, I just wanted to, to 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 mention that that's a fairly common approach to quality assurance um, uh, at at you know, s several agencies with with whom we've spoken. And I think that that's that, that's also reflected in this language. And I see that as as a, a fairly significant. Um, uh, that's fairly significantly different from an ALJ coming to a fully fledged, fully developed decision and then having someone tell them you should decide differently. I, I think we need to account for the concerns that you're mentioning when we think about decisional independence and <laughs> interaction quality review, but I, I don't want to lose sight of a, what is a fairly common and I think a relatively uncontroversial type of quality review, this sort of supervisory or peer engagement with each other's work. I could just add to that. I had exactly the peer review model in mind, uh, uh, but maybe the other thing to note here uh, is uh, that uh, ultimately whatever decision is drafted is still subject to all the kind of procedural due process requirements of a fully reasoned decision that articulates the 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 um, the basis uh, uh, on which a, a decision is made. The other thing I, I would just add is, of course, it it, 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 it there's no guarantee uh, what the valence of that review will be. There can be erroneous denials that if you go through a kind of peer review process or a supervisory review process, uh, get uh, 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 may have uh, certain legal errors or may miss something in the, the claims folder that as a result uh, turn into to grants. Uh, so I think ultimately the linchpin, uh, of course, of, of this kind of uh, quality assurance system is, is the accuracy of the decision-making process. Uh, so um, the, the other thing that, that we do note in the report is that there are some really in interesting practices uh, emerging again from SSA where adjudicators can themselves contest uh, decisions that have been made uh, uh, by kind of reviewers. And then there's a, a, that can actually be really helpful for the agency to kind of understand where uh, there may be misunderstandings of applicable policy or where clarification might be needed. Danny, is there anyone else in the queue? Yes, we've got uh, Rob Gerard and Alexander Manuel. Sure, all right, Rob and then Alex. Uh, yeah, looking at this, I, I actually didn't have a problem with with nine, uh, basically explaining that uh, the nature of quality assurance could be uh, prior to a decision or after a decision, or with 10, which went quite a bit farther and got into the details of a particular type of quality assurance, the use of sampling after the fact. But, but 
it seemed to be that what was missing was kind of what happens in between. And I'm wondering if we need something between nine and 10 uh, consistent with the report to explain that agencies should consider a layered approach to quality assurance um, with uh, distinct operation support, peer review, and post adjudication review functions. So instead of just saying you can do it before, you can do it after. Um, and then if you do it after, here's one way to do it. Uh, why not go a little deeper and, and say uh, that uh, a layered approach is effective? Alexander? Yes, um, I, I just com uh, agree completely with Bill Funk on this. Uh, the bottom line is that it's true, judges talk to judges, but the judges understand the issues. Uh, they are well aware, for instance, uh, ex parte. Anything outside the record could jeopardize the entire proceeding uh, and should not be considered by the judge. So unless this language included, and here are the landmines, uh, you know, to just suggest that it, either a quality assurance approach uh, before or after or kind of on, on an even keel or on an even footing, I think is misleading. I think there's a lot of special issues to be concerned, concerned with if you're going to uh, have this, you know, beforehand consultation before you issue your decision. So, and even with the uh, artificial intelligence, I think they, um, uh, I, I assume those precautions are being taken, uh, but anybody could, uh, uh, file a FOIA or some kind of a suit and find out the processes and what went into that. And if there's anything that's of a, a ex parte nature, of course, that, that would jeopardize all of these proceedings. So uh, I, I just think if you're going to suggest that they, this be implemented beforehand, that you should give them an idea of what the uh, problems could, uh, what problems could arise from doing that. Aaron, uh, Dan Ho uh, would like to be heard. Is that sure, me? Dan. I think it's worth noting here uh, that we're not talking solely about uh, formal adjudications that, that are subject to the full trappings of APA 556 and 557. Uh, that is, we're talking uh, about a whole range of adjudicatory uh, proceedings that may or may not have uh, hearing uh, uh, requirements associated with them, and as a result, not the same kind of uh, sort of ex parte uh, restrictions that are uh, part of, of certain kinds of proceedings. So I do think that's why in the underlying report, we talk about this uh, the, the fact that this tension can exist depending on the formality of the proceeding. Uh, but for more informal kinds of uh, adjudications, I think the, the kinds of uh, um, concerns, Alex, that you're articulating uh, can be uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, distinct. I mean, uh, patent examiners, for instance, are uh, uh, supposed to do their own research uh, to look uh, at prior art. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, uh, part of the job obligation. And uh, the patent office has found it quite helpful to have a second pair of eyes, they literally call it a second pair of eyes, quality assurance program where patent examiners sort of re-examine the, the nature of the scientific evidence to see whether they see eye to eye as to whether there's prior art. So I, I'm, gonna jump, I'm gonna jump in the queue here. Usually we don't have recommendations that say agencies should follow the law because that's kind of almost the premise of, or the implicit premise of every, everything we say. But here, could we solve some of this problem by saying at the end, um, influencing agency decision making or otherwise, so after that, after that clause, um, or violate um, legal prohibitions? Would you make specific reference, Aaron, to the, um, uh, the a APA? We, we could. I don't know enough to know if it's just the APA. It could be such as the APA. Um, I don't know if there's other organic statutes that have their own prohibitions on this, but something like that to make sure that we're saying that don't do this if against the law. You should, or, or I guess Alexander's point, like the, the landmines, there's a landmine here, which is you might not have legal authority to do this. Um, so be aware of that. 
Uh, I had a different wordsmithing uh, thing that might might help. It's starting the sentence with in certain types of appropriate cases, review okay. that occurs before adjudication, uh, adjudicators make their decisions or during a period when they just blah, 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 uh, would allow errors to be corrected before the division or in some cases could have the effect of improperly so. All right, Danny, did you get that? Yeah, would allow errors on line 44, that's right. Would or could, either one. Mm -hmm. And Aaron, I'll note, uh, I believe Alexander and Rob Gerard both still have their hands up. Okay, and then uh, these probably will be the last two comments we have for our meeting. Um, so uh, Alexander, then uh, Robert. Alexander, do you have the floor? Yeah, I okay, just Rob. said I. Oh, there I you just are. wanted to make that I have I have a couple of comments, but I since we're out of time, I'm I'm just going to send these uh, send these in, and we can have them uh, before the next meeting. Great. All right. Perfect. All right, Robert. Yeah. Last thoughts of the day. Oh, sorry. I, I just wanted to say that at least for the type of adjudications we do, about seventy thousand of a year. Uh, adjudicating retirement claims, having the process occur prior to the decision is commonplace and expected. Uh, the way that much of the quality assurance occurs is an adjudicator has a live case that's not developed anywhere, that's not dealt with anywhere in our integrated manual system or in job aids. So they, they surface a question to our operations support staff, which requests an opinion from our policy staff the opinion comes down, the operations support staff gives specific guidance on that case, as well as agency-wide guidance for the adjudicators. So that's uh, quite commonplace in uh, uh, informal adjudications that don't involve ALJs. Thank you. Um, all right, and we'll probably have a version of that when we come back. Um, we're gonna close this up. I don't wanna keep anybody beyond the appointed hour. I know people have things to do. I appreciate everybody's time and very thoughtful comments. Um, I appreciate the consultants. Um, this is an excellent report. And, and Danny, who's been running an excellent show. Thank you, Danny. So here are just some closing remarks. Our next meeting will take place next week, uh, a week from today, Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, note that we welcome everyone's attendance um, for the December 16th plenary. Um, this is where we're, the entire entirety of the conference will vote on the proposed recommendation. If you have any questions or would like to attend um, and you aren't already invited as a member of ACUS, um, read, please read, um, email Danny. We can make sure that you can you know, get on that list. Um, and more information, of course, is available on this uh, on the ACUS website. Um, is there anything else that we need to add, Danny, before, before people can go? I would just say um, we encourage you all to submit comments, um, as Aaron mentioned earlier. Those are very helpful uh, in terms of the drafting process and to get those to you quickly before next week on Tuesday. And thank you, everybody. This is really helpful. All right. Take care. Have a good week. Bye, everyone.